Thank you, Candace. Um, welcome, everyone, on behalf of all of us at the Atlantic, uh, our core of journalists, our whole team. We're glad to have you here. Um, and let me welcome Arthur, our, our writer, uh, our happiness guru. Uh, Arthur, thank you for good you your happiness turtleneck on. I didn't realize that until I saw you. Good for you. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's the secret. The, uh, it's the secret, Jeff. Uh, <laughs> Um, Arthur, um, you're the inspiration, actually, for this uh, whole conference, in, in a way. Um, you've been providing our readers with some definitions and, and uh, some deep academic and spiritual understandings of happiness. So let's just start right at the most obvious question of all. What is happiness? Because the answer, as I understand it from reading, and talk, reading you and talking to you, is that the answer is not as obvious as many people think it is. So what is happiness? People think of happiness, and by the way, thanks to everybody for joining this. You know, if we could build a movement around the science of happiness and how to bring it to more people, we could literally change the world and we could do it quickly. It could start here with the Atlantic and with this particular community. So thank you for being committed to this in your own life and the lives of other people. Now, a lot of people ask, you know, if, if happiness is, is something you can write about, you have to be able to define it really easily. And, and of course, People tend to define it in different ways, but the biggest mistake that they make is thinking that happiness is just a feeling. That's one tiny aspect of happiness. That's called affect. If you want to understand fundamentally what happiness is, think of it as a, as a, as a meal, sort of subjective well-being. That's what we social scientists call it. And, and that meal has three macronutrients to it. The three macronutrients of happiness are enjoyment, satisfaction, and purpose. That's really important to keep in mind because enjoyment, satisfaction, and purpose, they come from different things and different experiences, and not all of them are actually even pleasant. When you look at purpose, for example, purpose requires, it requires challenge, it requires suffering, it requires pain, it requires being fully alive in the world, and, and, and here's the paradox of happiness. To get the full macronutrient profile of happiness, especially purpose, requires a little bit of unhappiness, maybe a lot of unhappiness as well. So it's a complex thing. But once you take it apart like that, you can really start understanding it. And that's what we're trying to do here at The Atlantic. So that's the first big way to understand happiness. Now, people who are unhappy, the first thing I do diagnostically, and, and when you write about happiness as a social scientist, and I teach about it at Harvard University, everybody treats you like a psychiatrist. And so they say, I'm unhappy. The first thing I do diagnostically is I see if they're unbalanced across this macronutrient profile. The same way if your nutrition was no good, I'd see if you're eating too many carbohydrates, not getting enough protein, for example. And so I'll see, you know, are you too heavy on enjoyment and, and too light on purpose? Is your satisfaction too low? You get the idea. Are you happy? Well, you know, that's a, that's a tricky question. Um, uh, I d I'm actually below it's average. Yes no. It's that. a binary, Arthur. It's a binary. Yes or no. <laughs> it's a Manichaean question. Happy or unhappy? So actually, you know, this Happier gives us an opportunity. We, we, we measured, we asked people to take a little assessment of their own happiness. One of the best, very short, psychometrically robust happiness scales when people were, were registering for the conference. And we collected the data. It was all anonymous, of course. And we actually have a graphic that we can put up that shows the happiness of the people who are here based on a, a four question survey of the, the general happiness index. So if we can actually show that, here's that this is actually a, a graphic that looks at what I was just talking about. So let's take this one down and go to the next one here. These are the happiness survey results. And what we find is that uh, on a one to seven scale, where one is the most miserable person you've ever met and seven is the happiest person you've ever seen, or the happiest person you can even imagine, most people on average, they come in around five. The, the mean score, the average score in the 20,000 people that are involved in this conference is 4.95, that's the mean. And for, for those of you statistics wonks out there, 5.25 is the median score. So Jeff, here's the answer to your question. I've taken this and my score is 3.75. I'm at about the 15th percentile among the population of people who are doing this. And you might say, well, that's weird. The Atlantic's happiness specialist, the social scientist who teaches this at Harvard University is below average. Well, that's actually not that abnormal. You know, people who, I know everybody in America who studies happiness for a living, they're studying it for a reason. You know, I, my wife is, is actually a 6.8, <laughs> uh, 
and 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 I say, you know, you know, I'm I'm writing about this aspect of happiness and that aspect of happiness, and she says, why are you studying that in the same way that I would ask, why are you studying air or water when something is scarce for you, it gets your interest when it's abundant. It's more prosaic. So I'm a little bit below average, but here's the good news, Jeff. I am rising because this happiness work, the stuff we talk about, the stuff that we write about, if you study it, take it seriously, apply it to your life and share it, you will get happier. And I'm living proof. I've gone up an entire digit in the past two years. The, uh, that's because you're affiliated with The Atlantic, quite obviously. The... Um... Talk about the pursuit of happiness as an American concept. People don't really understand what the founders meant while uh, when, when they talked about the pursuit of happiness. So do that and then add on to that answer. Uh, how does one effectively pursue happiness, assuming that that is a thing that one can do? But talk about the, the yeah, history so, of the concept. Yeah, so the, the concept, the pursuit of happiness, this was super radical because in, 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 in historic times, the idea that each one of us should be concerned with our individual happiness, or let alone that we have a right to at least pursuing our happiness, was utterly anathema to sort of the collectivist idea, the lump and masses. The only people who could, who could pursue their happiness effectively would be the, the landed gentry, the lucky ones, basically. And this radical and American experiment basically said that we had this, we had this right, this maybe even a responsibility to seek our happiness as we see fit, to define it and actually go after it. Thomas Jefferson wrote that, and, and he, he cribbed the language from the Declaration of Independence, actually from the Virginia Declaration of Rights, which was written by George Mason. And that talked about life, liberty, and the pursuit of property as God-given rights. And he changed the last one to the pursuit of happiness. He was asked later, why did you write that? And he literally, Thomas Jefferson said, I was taking dictation from the American mind. In other words, the zeitgeist of colonial America at the time, which is obviously hugely imperfect because there was whole populations who, who couldn't pursue this. But, but the whole idea, this radical concept was that we had this new nation that was quite varied. You know, people had different stories. But the one thing that people had in common was that they were ambitious riffraff. That is, by the way, still the American ethos that I find compelling. I'm ambitious riffraff too. This is really what's the, what you know sets us apart. And the progress that we can make, the things that we can do, the way we can treat our lives as a startup, that's the pursuit of happiness. That's not the attainment of happiness, but the pursuit itself, the journey itself, that's the advanced stuff. What are the... Um... What are the key mistakes people make uh, in the pursuit uh, when they're looking for happiness or in pursuing happiness? Well, this gets at <clears throat> sort of part of the question that, you, that I didn't quite answer just a second ago. Um, there are, when we're looking at this meal of subjective well-being, I talked about macronutrients. There, there are also there are dishes in that meal. There are things that you want to have a really sumptuous, really enjoyable meal. There are four things, actually, and the four habits, the four ingredients, the four dishes of happiness, this is the far right column here, is what I call just in the vernacular faith, family, friendship, and work. And when I say faith, I don't mean necessarily a traditional religious faith. It could be, but not necessarily. I'm talking about a, a life philosophy or spirituality or some sense of the transcendent that's bigger than your individual ordinary circumstances. And the reason for that is very simple. When you're focusing on your on, on just your life and I'm going to work and I'm doing this and I'm seeing my friends and and it's like this watching the same boring television show over and over and over again. So the transcendent zooms you out. Family life are the ties that bind, the kinship ties that cannot be broken. Friendship is where you have your most really most in, intimate relationships where you should and work simply means earning your success and serving others. Those are the two characteristics of work that bring that. Those are the things we need to invest in every day. I mean, it, it, it's, it's actually shockingly simple, although hard, but we need to put an investment in this diversified portfolio of happiness every single day, not over-indexing on work or anything else and getting all of these things. Now, the mistake that people make is that they have the wrong portfolio, the wrong set of dishes. 
And the dishes that people think will bring them happiness and they invest in, and that, or that they eat too much of, we should say, if we're gonna keep this metaphor going, I may be attenuating the metaphor, are money, power, pleasure, and fame. Those are the bad four. Those are the things that you think will bring satisfaction, but do not. And in the case of fame or prestige in particular, you can only ever be happy in spite of it, despite the fact that people think that they'll actually be happy if they get it. It's hugely paradoxical. It's one of the great sources of misery that people make this mistake. People go for money, power, pleasure, and fame, and they should be investing in faith, family, friendship, and work. If we can just knock out the bad four and put in the good four, we go just miles down the road toward greater happiness. Well, let's talk about money for a second, because, you know, it's easy w when you have a well-paying job, you don't have to be super wealthy, but it's, but it's easy to put down money as a source of happiness. But the lack of money must create extraordinary levels of unhappiness. Am I wrong? Yeah, no, you're correct. And I wrote about that a few weeks ago in the column. So those who are, you know, people who are watching who are regular readers, you know, it, it, remember this column three weeks ago, you know, can you buy happiness or how to buy happiness? Now, the first thing to keep in mind is that when your mother told you that money doesn't buy happiness, your mother was right. Your mother is always right. <laughs> but but the, to put a, you know, a finer point on that from a scientific perspective, what money can do is money can lower unhappiness. Now, I'm not splitting hairs here. This is not, you know, angels on the head of a pin. Happiness and unhappiness are not opposites. This is a big misconception. As a matter of fact, happy and unhappy cognitions are processed in different hemispheres of the prefrontal cortex. So when people say that, that unhappiness is the absence of happiness, they're wrong. You basically are lighting up different parts of your brain when you're having happy or unhappy sensations. So what you find is that, that having more money will not bring happiness, it will affect your your mood balance, however, especially when you're at the lower end of the income spectrum, because it will lower your unhappiness up to a point. So what happens is, and I remember this, you know, for the first 12 years of my adult life, I hadn't gone to college and I was making my living as a musician. And so I was poor. And, and, and I remember I went six years without being able to afford going to the dentist. Although I will note that I never seemed to be without cigarettes. So, you know, make of that what you will. But anyway, during those years, I remember, you know, it's like I was suffering through cavities and the whole thing. And, and it was actually a source of unhappiness. It wasn't a lack of happiness. It was affirmative unhappiness. And then when I finally had enough money to go to the dentist, that relieved a lot of my unhappiness. So what happens is that money relieves unhappiness up to a particular point. Generally speaking, economists find that somewhere between seventy-five dollars and $100,000 a year of household income before taxes, it doesn't really matter how you measure it. We're basically talking about something that's not vast wealth. And beyond that, it doesn't, it, it, it no longer relieves unhappiness and it doesn't bring happiness. And the mistake that we make, like Pavlov's dogs, is that we know that our affect balance improved early on and we go for that sensation for the rest of our lives thinking that we're gonna feel better, thinking we'll feel better if we actually get more, more, more. And it's a mistake because we actually won't. Uh, talk about genetics for a minute. I, I imagine there are a lot of people who are watching this who are thinking, oh, this is all well and good, all these good practices, but uh, knowing me, knowing my family, knowing family background, people are thinking to themselves, I, you know, I, I just didn't get dealt a good genetic uh, hand here. Uh, talk about overcoming that and talk about the, the balance um, between genetics and practice. Yeah, so genetics are a real thing. People who say they were dealt a bad hand, they're probably right. Um, there's a, there's a, the studies of siblings, of, of fraternal twins, and especially of identical twins. There's one database of identical twins that were separated at birth and adopted to separate families, then reunited as adults and given personality tests. This was all complete, this was not unethical. You wouldn't do this as a social science experiment. It happened naturally. Um, because it's just the way that they were adopting babies back in the in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. And, and it was a really joyful thing, this voluntary reuniting of people who didn't know they had identical twins in many cases. Quite amazing and, and really lovely. But one of the things that they found is that, that, that personality characteristics are almost all between 40 and 80% genetic. Now, I hate that. I don't want that. I'm an American. <laughs> I want to build my life. Um, it's how to build a life is the name of my column, for Pete's sake. 
but but I have to recognize that that's true. And one of the dimensions is is baseline happiness, which is about fifty percent genetic. So it, you know, to all of us, list, all the people listening to us, your your mother really did make you unhappy, <laughs> or 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 happy. You know, you you decide. Um, and, and so you can be dealt a bad hand. The reason that I'm at 3.75 is is a lot of it has to do with the fact that I have very gloomy genetics. You know, it was you know I come from a family of of pretty gloomy people actually. And so what I'm having to work on is the other 50 percent all the time. So the, this is actually really good news for everybody watching. If you you know you you have depressed parents or you have a lot of mental illness or mood disorders in your family, okay, okay, you know get it treated. If in doubt, check it out. That's all true. But you have half, and especially you have those habits, which are the, a quarter, literally a quarter of your, of your happiness is under your direct control. That is unbelievably empowering. Don't spend your time worrying about your genetic bad hand. Spend your time investing on getting yourself above your baseline and staying there as much as you possibly can in the same way that you would do that in any other part of your life. You know, if you're dealt a genetic bad hand in anything, you're actually going to try to use the tools at your disposal to as a recompense for it, as a, as a compensatory mechanism to get yourself better off. And that's the way, the same way to think about happiness as well. Talk, talk about the role of events larger than yourself in the creation and maintenance of happiness. Uh, I'm not only thinking about the pandemic, but I want you to talk about that, of course. I'm even thinking about an overall uh, political climate in this country, which generally speaking does not has not made people very, very happy over the last several years and maybe even beyond just the last several years. Um, talk about that feeling of lack of control that people had have over over the their destiny of their communities, their country and, and, and so on and how you and how you can work within frameworks you can't control. I mean, use the pandemic, obviously, because uh, mm -hmm. we're coming out. Uh, an historic experience for the entire world. So, yeah, so we talked about genetics and we talked about habits. The last part, the last building block in, in what, what is leading to happiness. And again, I've, now I'm measuring it in a third way. So if we can put up that slide again, that very first slide again, you know, the, the, the macronutrients that we had, and then we had the dishes. Well, the basic ingredients of happiness are genetics and habits. And the third part is circumstances. And that's what you're talking about here. Now, here's the really interesting thing. Everybody thinks, almost everybody thinks naturally that circumstances are everything. You know, if I can, you know, if I can get my circumstances right, then if I can affect them in a particular way, then I'll finally find satisfaction. I'll finally be happy. And so, you know, if I get into law school or I get a really good job or if I can avoid having a, a car accident or I can, you know, I don't have a bad breakup, then I'm going to be happy. And the truth of the matter is that circumstances do affect happiness. Somewhere be you know somewhere around 25 percent of your happiness in any particular time, but they don't last very long. And how you frame them is critical. <laughs> if you feel like you are a victim of your circumstances, they will affect you a lot more and a lot more negatively than if you reframe them. So let's look at the coronavirus epidemic as a classic circumstance. It it, it depressed a lot of people. Although my column this morning in the Atlantic shows that introverts actually got a little happier during the coronavirus epidemic, whereas extroverts like you and me, our happiness you know, tanked. Now, the way that we can actually reframe that circumstance so that we can mitigate the unhappiness that comes from that and maybe even turn it into a source of, or an opportunity for flourishing, is the way to do that is to, is to ask the right questions. So for example, everybody says when they talk about the coronavirus epidemic, they ask, you know, what do you miss from before that you wanna go back to? And what do you want to get rid of that you're, you hate about the coronavirus epidemic? Those are the two wrong questions. The two right questions, the reframing questions are, what do you not miss from before the coronavirus epidemic and you don't want to go back to? What are the toxic relationships? What are the practices that you hate? What are the things that you did out of sheer inertia? What were the lies you were telling yourself about your life? Those circumstances that you don't want to go back to and you want to use the circumstance, the disequilibrating once in a lifetime circumstance of the coronavirus epidemic that gave you 12 or 16 months away from those things to not go back to those things. The second question is, what do you actually kind of like? I know that net net, you prefer not to have the coronavirus epidemic, but I bet there's a list of six or seven things that you like 
like, you know, having lunch with your partner, um, you know, spending more time in your neighborhood, being able to walk around, having a little walk after lunch, whatever it happens to be, even if it's little or insignificant, that you, you're going to miss. Make a list of the stuff you're not going to go back to and make a list of the things you're going to keep. That reframing gives you agency, which will bring you happiness. And if you adopt those things and are serious about it, you will come out of the coronavirus epidemic better than you went in. One final question for you in a, about a minute that we have. And by the way, I'm getting texts from friends who are saying, you're an extrovert. Arthur Brooks just accused you of being an extrovert. I think I'm an introverted extrovert. Maybe that would be the best way of describing it. Well, there's the, a quiz uh, in my column today, by the way. There's a quiz in my column that everybody can take to find out where they are with respect to the population on extroversion. The, um, the the last question, and just take take 30 seconds on this, is is what advice you would give people? I mean, this this moment coming out of the pandemic is an enormous chance for some people to reset, right? They, they've learned some things about themselves. They've learned some things about where they are in the world. Um, I mean, what is talk about as specifically as you can in a short period of time, uh, what practices you would encourage people to do right now? How do you do the assessment? that says, okay, you know what? I'm dropping X and Y and Z because I found them to be toxic in my life. Talk about that for the last 30 seconds of this. Okay, so the way to think about that is to go back to one thing that we already talked about, which was the dishes in the happiness meal, faith, family, friendship, and work, and do a little diagnostic on yourself. Do a little inventory on yourself and say, what do I need to beef up? What do I need to do? Now, over the course of the day, as people are watching this festival, I've got these little interjections, some things, some, some, some gratitude practices, some other kinds of happiness practices that are really geared toward those four things. So watch these two minute interludes that come through over the course of the day, which are positive practices for it. If you're gonna remember one thing and one thing only, this is a advice that I got from one of my Harvard colleagues. His name is Robert Waldinger, who runs the the Harvard Grant Study, which is 80 years of data across people's lives. What do they do in their 20s, 30s, and 40s that makes them happiest in their 60s, 70s, and 80s? And he says that the, the whole summary of his study is five words. Happiness is love, full stop. The one thing to remember is to cultivate our relationships with our family, with our friends, with our neighbors, with our enemies, is finding actual ways that we can have love and reconciliation with other people. The beginning of the happiness movement is the love that we have for each other as sisters and brothers across all differences. That is the ultimate embrace of diversity. That is the ultimate expression of love. And that is the shortcut to true human happiness, the punchline, I hope, of this entire conference. Can I get an amen from the congregation? Um, <laughs> Arthur, thank you. That was a very uplifting way to end this. Um, you seem happier than a 375, I have to say. Um, Arthur, it's great having you at the Atlantic. Uh, we really appreciate everything that you're doing. And uh, thank you, everyone, for, for listening to our conversation. Thanks very much.